Okay, everyone, so uh, we're uh, ready for the main event. So I'm very pleased to um, recognize Dr. Connie Weaver, who is the recipient of the Edna Park Lectureship this year. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Weaver has a very long CV and an equally long bio, so I just pick, I'll pick, you, pick some highlights just to emphasize um, very clearly why she was awarded this uh, lectureship this year. So she's a distinguished professor at Purdue University in the Department of Nutrition uh, Science in West uh, Lafayette, Indiana. She's an elected member of the National Academies of Science Engineering Medicine since 2010 and a member of the Food and Nutrition Board. She is a member of the FDA Science Advisory Board and the NIH Advisory Committee on Research and Women's Health. She's a founder and director of the Women's Global Health Initiative at Purdue University. Um, many of us have read Dr. Weaver's work over the years. Her research interests include mineral bioavailability, calcium metabolism, bone and cardiovascular health. And Dr. Weaver is a past president of the American Society for Nutritional Sciences. She is on the board of trustees of the International Life Sciences Institute, as well as other board memberships. She's got a long list of awards, and I just picked two that I found interesting. She's uh, uh, the 2017 17 recipient, 16 recipient of the Trailblazer Award by the Institute of Food Technology and the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And this is an award to recognize exceptional leaders who advanced the science at the interface of dietetics and food science, and the David Kurchewski Career Achievement Award from the American Society of Nutritional Sciences last year. Uh, Dr. Weaver was appointed to the 2005 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, uh, worked with Dr. Beaton over the years on dietary reference guidelines, and she's published over 400 research articles to date. So I uh, introduce you to Dr. Weaver, and we look very f much forward for your presentation. Thank you for your kind introduction, and thank you for this um, honor and for everyone coming out tonight. It was a real surprise and treat. Wonderful day I spent uh, seeing old familiar friends and meeting new ones and the next generation of professionals. You have a lot to be proud of here, what you've been accomplishing. So today we're going to talk about, or tonight, it's getting darker, uh, about the role of diet in preventing osteoporosis and how some nutrients or items in our food may be um, in insufficient supply, so what is enough, and others we may have to worry about being too much, and we'll talk about those. Here are my disclosures. Um, so we're gonna talk about bone health across the lifespan. I've been interested in two periods especially. One, when we're rapidly growing bone in adolescent years, we, we put down 40 to 50 percent of our adult peak bone mass in those few years of adolescence. So if we don't get that right, we've really lost a lot we can do about bone for the rest of our lives. And then I'm worried again when we go through a big loss of bone, especially around the menopause in women and more slowly than in men and women as we go through life. So those transition periods are when bone is rapidly turning over and I think um, you might have the most response to external factors like diet. So starting with the first side, when we're growing our peak bone mass, why is peak bone mass so important? One is peak, the mass that's acquired during childhood determines childhood fractures. And maybe we don't worry about that so much, you know, even if 30 to 50 percent of children have one fracture. Um, like my son, we went skiing, he broke his arm, he puts on a cast, everybody signs it, and he still goes skiing. You know, it didn't really hamper him very much like it would later in life. But five to 10% of additional peak bone mass acquired during adolescence can result in a 25 to 
lower risk of hip fracture later in life. And that really matters because a fracture later in life, unlike my son, it does decrease your mobility and it's got a lot of pain associated with it. It decreases your social life and quality of life and it's expensive. Around the world, we spend $131 billion annually for hip fractures alone. So it's a health care and public health concern in more than one way. Concentrating, though, on building peak bone mass for a little bit longer, I was um, on a, privileged to be part of a writing group that created this position paper for the National Osteoporosis Foundation where we systematically reviewed like 19 different factors about lifestyle choices that can influence peak bone mass. So we collected all the literature from the year 2000 on and evaluated the strength of the evidence. And two major items came out with A grade, which is the strongest evidence from the literature. And one was calcium and one was physical activity. All the others were a little bit less strong possibly or partly because there are fewer studies, but also they were inconsistent or there was just too little evidence. So vitamin D and dairy intake were in the categories of a B grade. So the vitamin D literature is less than for calcium, but it's also inconsistent. Dairy was pretty consistent, but there were many fewer studies than for um, calcium. Physical activity, that process made me realize how differently nutritionists approach research compared to people studying physical activity. So nutritionists tend to be reductionists. We study one nutrient at a time, calcium, vitamin D, um, every single nutrient or a particular food pattern. Whereas physical activity, they lump it all together. You know, so jumping or any other kind of activity was all lumped together and they don't try to dissect it out. So it looked like the literature was really strong because it was all combined. If we combined all the nutrients together, we would have a powerhouse base of literature too. So very interesting. We can learn from each other um, about our ways of doing research, I think. Almost all the others received a C or D grade because there's just too few studies. And that's a symptom of research in children. We don't give enough attention to children generally compared to adults. So I wanted to show you just a little insight to what we've done trying to relate calcium or diet and physical activity. So at the time we did, I had this PhD student doing this study where she wanted to know what's the relative importance of calcium being adequate in the diet or physical activity, weight loading exercise, um, and how do they affect different bone sites and are they synergistic or um, complementary? How does it work? So we looked, went to the literature and found that jumping interventions in children were the most powerful. So this particular study was jumping off of boxes. The, this Robin Fuchs was getting her PhD at the time at Oregon State and I was asked to be on her committee. She's now on faculty at IUPUI in Indianapolis, small world, but um, she randomized classes of children into either an impact loading intervention where they had to jump off the boxes for 10 minutes a day. They could jump off of 100 boxes in the, this uh, exercise period between classes in just 10 minutes. They're, they were that fast. Um, it's very similar to a study that was done here in Canada by Heather McKay, which was jump at the bell. Maybe some of you have heard about that. So every time the bell would ring for classes to change, um, they would have to jump in place five times and then go on to their class. And both studies gave really similar outcomes where the intervention of either jumping at the bell or jumping off the boxes improved gain in bone mass through one school year of six to eight percent. That's pretty substantial compared to the group that didn't get that jumping intervention. So we, 
my student wanted to study it in an animal model where sh she could really dissect the different bones and invasively and determine the effects of diet and exercise. So we knew jumping was a good idea from these studies in children. And how do you get a rodent to jump? You know, you can't say jump, jump, you know, or even prod it to jump. And all the exercise studies in the literature didn't apply to jumping. So it was swimming, that doesn't apply, or running on a treadmill or, or in a, a round circle cage. None of those had the impact of jumping. So she created this idea of dropping the rats. So she dropped in a pilot study at different heights just to make sure she wasn't causing any stress, stress fractures in the rodents, but she was creating a difference in bone mass. Well, how long do you wait between drops and how many drops do you do a day? So we went to the left a model that a colleague of mine at Indiana University School of Medicine was using, where he did a loaded um, ulna and um, buried the seconds in between, how many drops and everything, and it maxim, max, what became a maximum increase in bone strength if you did 10 loads. And the perfect timing was 14 seconds apart. So my student came back to the dropping and did 10. 10 drops per rat a day, 14 seconds apart um, for a period of time and got these incredible results that look like this. This is just one bone measure, bone volume over total volume in the, the uh, ulna because the dropping was loading the quadruped in ways similar to jumping of the child. And so you see on the left is calcium plus, meaning adequate calcium, calcium minus on the right, inadequate calcium for uh, the recommended intakes for a rat. On top is the impact from the dropping, and the dashed line is no impact. So the best combination is having impact with adequate calcium, and the worst combination, lower right, is inadequate calcium with no impact loading. So a really nice interaction, as you might expect. Now I'm going to talk to you about uh, uh, examples of studies I've done in adolescence to try to determine how much calcium is the optimal for building peak bone mass and many other nutrients we've studied. And the way that you study how much of a nutrient you need, at least in my idea, deal world, is a controlled feeding study. Well, how do you get kids to be on a controlled feeding study? You can't trust them to eat foods you would send home with a kid. Uh, trust me about that. So we thought we need kids to be in a controlled situation for long enough that we could measure changes in calcium metabolism. So we decided three week periods were kind of minimal amounts that we would do an intervention. And we could fit two three week periods in, in one summer in a crossover design. So we ran them as summer research camps and kids came to campus we rented um, residence halls for them to live in, and we've run 11 of these studies related to bone. And we started in 1990, and we've studied girls and boys and the four major races and different diet conditions. And while we have them, we've got to entertain them so that they'll stay all summer with us. So we do exercises and education and all kinds of activities. We spend as much time on the, the scheduling and supervising these kids as we do on the actual research. And mostly they love to be at camp. We try to make it really fun. So a design would look like this, two three week periods. It takes them a week to get into equilibrium on their diet that we're giving them. And then so the next two weeks are balance studies where we measure everything that's going in and everything that's coming out. And after they've equilibrated in a week, we give them stable calcium isotopic tracers so that we can 
study calcium metabolism. So they might come in and be like on a high calcium intake one of those sessions, they go home for the washout, they come back and they might be on a low calcium intake the next session or vice versa. Or high salt and low salt or no vitamin D supplements with vitamin D supplements the other time. Those are the kinds of ways it works. So early on, we studied white girls, and we studied them over a range of intakes. So each one girl got two different calcium intakes, but different girls were put on different pairs of calcium intakes, so we could cover a whole range of calcium intakes, and then determine how much calcium they retained on those intakes, and since calcium is a constant fraction of bone, it's the same as giving you uh, bone acquisition rates. So these three lines are the mean and 95% confidence intervals around the data at the different calcium intakes. And it goes up, up, and up until at some point you get a plateau. And at that point, you're just excreting all the extra calcium. It doesn't do you any good for building bone. So we reasoned that was the intake where it crosses that line that would be optimal for building peak bone mass. And that was at 1,300 milligrams a day, and that's still the recommended intake for adolescents for North America. We did food records to determine what their usual intakes were before they came to camp. And that summer, the girls averaged about 900 milligrams a day, which is still pretty high compared to many cultures. But if they had been taking in the optimal of 1,300 milligrams over a year, they can build 4% more skeleton. And over two years, 8% more skeleton, et cetera. And that can make a huge difference in reducing risk of osteoporosis. With the isotopic tracers, we learned that if they went from inadequate calcium intake to adequate calcium intake, they absorbed more calcium and they, that suppressed bone resorption by the same number of milligrams. So for every milligram of extra calcium you absorb, you're preventing equal amounts of milligrams of calcium from leaving the bone. So you get into a much greater positive balance while you're building bone. Now I'm going to tell you uh, one of the other stories, because there's many in 11 studies, but I want to tell you about the salt story. We brought black and white girls matched for the same sexual maturity and the same bone mineral density to campus to give them high and low salt diets in the crossover design. And this shows you kind of a structure of how we completely monitor their intake and supervise it. So our basal diet contained 1.3 grams of sodium per day, which was about at the fifth percentile of salt intake according to the literature for this age group. And the high sodium period, we gave them four grams of sodium a day, which was considered the 95th percentile at the time. And we gave it in Gatorade and soups twice a day. So the kids like the salty soup, they like the not salty Gatorade. So they're always happy or unhappy about one or the other <laughs> in that time period. And we learned quite an amazing story about the difference due to race in calcium and sodium handling. So first I'm gonna show you the urinary sodium output. They were the same in black and whites on the low sodium diet. And then on the high sodium diet, what we were expecting from the literature is that they would just excrete all the extra salt because that's what you read to keep in a, a electrolyte balance. But the blacks couldn't do it. The whites and yellow excreted lots more sodium on the same high salt diet than the blacks could. So the blacks went into extreme sodium retention. When you excrete an ion of sodium, it pulls out with it an ion of calcium. So while those whites are excreting lots of extra sodium in the urine, they're also excreting lots of extra calcium that you can see in the upper left. When you put it in terms of balance, the blacks are in blue on the top 
and the whites in yellow on the bottom, high salt compromises your bone growth in both races, but the blacks are so much more efficient at building bone mass and retaining calcium than the whites that on the high salt diet, they're better off than the whites on the low salt diet. So um, the underpinnings of both osteoporosis and hypertension, I think, are explained as early as adolescence by the difference in sodium and calcium handling. Blacks have a lot lower incidence of osteoporosis because they're not throwing the calcium out in the urine even in the face of a high salt diet like the whites are. But when the blacks get a little older than puberty, that extra salt is going into an expanded blood volume because of water retention, and that's giving them a higher incidence of hypertension compared to whites. If you do take measures like getting adequate calcium in your diet, getting the salt reduced, um, and other things that I don't have time to go into, such that you increase development of peak bone mass by 10%, it's predicted that that could delay onset of osteoporosis by 13 years and decrease risk of fracture in postmenopausal women by 50%. Some other conclusions from CAMP other than the requirement being 1,300 milligrams a day for adolescents it turned out to be true for white girls, white boys, black girls, and black boys, even though they built more bone with it, their threshold intake was still 1,300 milligrams a day, but it was different for Chinese American girls. Their intake plateau was 940 milligrams a day. So Asian girls need lots less calcium to achieve their maximum bone accretion compared to the other races. But 940 is still a lot higher than many Asian culture adolescent girls receive. So we still need to pay attention to that. And the, it works through increasing absorbed calcium suppresses bone resorption. Let's turn to vitamin D for a few minutes. The current Institute of Medicine recommendations for vitamin D are for adolescents are largely based on this research, where it was a one-year randomized control trial of zero, 200, and 400 international units per day given to 212 adolescent girls as a supplement. And you'll see over the course of the year, the status really increased on the left, so 25-hydroxy vitamin D, and that resulted in increased bone gain on the right. So we took that information and we wanted to do a randomized control trial and compare white and black girls and boys and in northern U.S. and southern U.S. For a, to see if there's a latitude change difference. We gave, randomized them to five, one of five different doses up to as much as 4,000 international units per day. We did the study during the winter and we did achieve a change in status that was the same in whites on the left and blacks on the right. And it was a dose response change in vitamin D status. And it did nothing to influence calcium absorption, which is the main thing you think of taking vitamin D4. So our conclusion is in North America, anyway, um, in the U.S., and Indiana is uh, a northern latitude, not as north as Canada, but we don't produce any vit cutaneous vitamin D in our skin in the winter either, that we still had enough. Our children had enough vitamin D to optimize fractional calcium absorption and bone acquisition, and they don't need to be supplemented. That contrasts from the other study I showed you that was done in Finland, where they are much more deficient than in North America. Now I'm going to switch over to the other life stage and talk to you about some of our work in postmenopausal women. Philosophically, calcium is a fr constant fracture a uh, constant fraction of bone. So 
your calcium stores indicate how much bone mass you have. If you don't get enough calcium in your diet, then your body has to draw on the bone and resorb it to keep your blood levels of calcium constant because it's absolutely critical to all life functions to have constant levels of calcium in your blood. So the bone becomes the bank, the reserve, when your diet is deficient. And if and you can't make calcium, you have to get it from diet or the bone to put it in your blood. So you would keep drawing on that bone bank year after year on a low calcium intake to the point you're at risk for fracture. I was part of a systematic review, a meta-analysis, looking at calcium and vitamin D supplements which is different than an adequate diet or not, but still supplements in uh, postmenopausal women showed an overall favorable reduction in risk of hip fractures by as much as 30%. But we've been experiencing concern over calcium supplements. Are they safe? This came about because a group in New Zealand that initially did a calcium supplement study to look at bone, which was favorable, went back and reanalyzed data for adverse effects retrospectively. And they found an increase in myocardial infarction in the group that had the calcium supplements. That caused a big sensation throughout the health field and the media. So you saw advertisements like this, 30% increased risk of heart attack if you're on calcium supplements. And many physicians stopped recommending calcium and vitamin D supplements to uh, their patients because of this concern. Well, many groups around the world started doing secondary analysis or prospective studies, and the results are all over the board with different outcome measures. And they don't have a mechanism, there's no dose response. So I started getting calls from a lot of groups saying, oh, sales are falling off, people are st uh, stopping buying so much milk, and it, should we be concerned about this? And I said, well, I have an idea of maybe how we can look at it deliberately and look for invasively what's going on and if there's any risk. You have to do an animal model to control the diet long enough with um, able to follow calcification of the arteries in a controlled fashion and to be looking at it invasively. So I knew I wanted to propose an animal model, but when I looked at the literature, the animal models were bad. They were using rabbits and rodents, and they don't develop plaques or the arteries don't become calcified in the same way as humans. So I wanted to try a new model and a new technique. So this star at the bottom right is called an Asaba pig. It's called an Asaba miniature pig, but I learned miniature means 200 pounds instead of 300 pounds. It's still a really pretty big pig. But it turned out Purdue was raising a research colony of Asaba pigs. And come to find out, there is an island off the coast of Georgia called Asaba Island that's not inhabited by people. So they found these pigs that through many generations were either feasting when there were acorns ripe or the grasses were ready and they would gorge. And the rest of the time they're starving to death because nobody's living on that island to feed them. So over time, they evolved to have a, what they call a thrifty gene. So if you give them fat, high fat diets, they really put on the fat. And a researcher, a cardiovascular researcher had profiled, if you put them on a fat diet, high fat diet, they knew exactly when fatty streaks would form, when they got metabolic disease, hypertension, calcification occurred. So we really knew the profile. And I went to all these companies that had been asking me for advice and put out a proposal and said, I think we should use this pig model with 
traditional and innovative outcome measures to determine if there's a risk from high calcium. So we randomized these adult pigs to either the normal calcium recommended intake or very high calcium up to the upper level, either as dairy or as calcium carbonate, the common supplement. And we followed them for six months during this process while they're developing early stage calcification of the arteries and car met cardiometabolic disorders. We used this rare tracer of calcium that you can measure atom quantities of and we did metabolism at the end and accumulation in arteries. So we found six months of feeding of the high calcium from calcium carbonate or dairy didn't alter any cardiovascular function, any disease burden, any plaque formation, any calcification of the arteries, anything that we could measure, it didn't matter. So then I participated in developing a position paper with a National Osteoporosis Foundation by first doing a systematic review with Tufts and then joining forces with the American Society for Preventive Cardiology that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 2016. And they said there's a B level or moderate evidence that calcium with or without vitamin D intake from food or supplements has no relationship to the risk of coronary vascular or cerebral vascular disease incidence mortality. And so calcium from foods and supplements up to the upper level, tolerable upper level, should be considered safe from a cardiovascular standpoint. So where do you get your calcium in your diet? You can get it from supplements or fortified foods. There's some, especially some beverages. And then uh, dairy products, which has calcium and a lot of bone relevant nutrients. Usually when you do food assessments almost anywhere in the world, about 70% of a person's dietary calcium comes from dairy. Here's the total map of milk consumption worldwide, and it's falling. Here shows you out of the last dietary guidelines in the US, in males on the left and females on the right, the average intake in the yellow dots over the age groups compared to the recommended intake range in blue. And it's declining, so our calcium sources are declining, coupled with a fear of the calcium supplementation, our intakes are going down. I spent a lot of the first part of my career looking at calcium absorption from a lot of different foods. So we uh, labeled cow's milk with stable calcium isotopic tracer, I went to Kraft and made it into cheese and yogurt and different things, and it didn't matter what the form was. Calcium absorption is around 30% for adults, regardless of the dairy form. Compared to some other foods, sometimes it's much better, sometimes it's not quite as good in terms of fractional absorption. So labeling food by uh, giving an IV with a tracer to the cow or growing plants hydroponically, like for spinach in this particular picture, look how much better the calcium absorption from milk is compared to spinach. It's 10 times higher from the milk. But it also depends on age. So using that intrinsically labeled milk from the cow with the isotopes, if you look at the kids we studied up on top, their average calcium absorption from a glass of milk was 40%. The college students, a little bit older, 30%. If you got as old as me at that time, 25%. And when we measured people over 75, it'd be down to 5% from the same glass of milk. None of us are as efficient as a baby compared to the human milk where we labeled um, the human milk and determined the baby could absorb 80% of the calcium from breast milk. We've studied almost all the food sources of calcium and the content varies as well as the fractional absorption. So this is an abbreviated table showing the calcium content per serving on the left. Then we multiply it by the fractional absorption that we determined to get the milligrams absorbed. And for a handy reference, how many servings do you need to substitute for one glass of milk or one cup of 
yogurt that we set at one. So dried beans, for example, you'd need 12.3 half cup servings of dried beans to replace the amount of calcium that can be absorbed from one glass of milk. You need four and a half cups of broccoli. You need three and a half cups of kale, servings of kale, and 15.5 servings of spinach to replace the amount of calcium you can get for one cup. So it's not practical to think you can go to other uh, sources in your diet and replace dairy for the calcium. You have to go to fortified foods. So here is calcium set tofu, which is about one to one. That worked. We've studied calcium from uh, enriched soy beverage, soy milk, and found that if it was fortified with calcium carbonate, it was equal to the calcium from cow's milk. If it's made from fortified with tricalcium phosphate, not quite as good, but still pretty good. And when we reported this, this led to um, the ability to incorporate calcium fortified soy beverage in our school lunch program. It hadn't been allowed before that. But now there's a lot of plant-based beverages to pick from. And we don't know the calcium absorption from any of them but soy. We just got a grant, so in a couple years, hopefully, we'll have published what the calcium bioavailability is from almond, coconut, and rice milk as well. But I can tell you, compositionally, there's differences. They don't have nearly as much protein in some cases. Potassium is way low compared to uh, cow's milk or soy beverage, and certainly the cost is up, if that's a consideration for you. Um, another line of research that we have going on is looking at factors that will improve bone retention or utilization of calcium. And one of the most successful foods that we've found is a prebiotic fiber, soluble corn fiber. So I'm going to show you uh, the results from this publication in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 2016. And I want to tell you about the method before I get to the results. The traditional way to see, to evaluate if an intervention is effective for bone is to use bone mineral density or DEXA scans. Bone turns over really slowly at a rate of about 26% per year for trabecular bone and 3% per year for cortical bone. So it takes years to find bone changes by imaging, by DEXA. And FDA approves a four-year randomized controlled trial to look at bone mineral density trial to have a drug be able to say it would be an effective um, treatment for osteoporosis. We've developed a 42 to 50 day screening method by using this rare isotope, calcium 41, that we can quantitate at atom quantities with this big accelerator mass spectrometer that we have. And the concept is you deep label the bone and then see if the rate that's leaving in your urine is decreased by an intervention. So for our soluble corn fiber study, we did a randomized order crossover for 50-day interventions with 50-day washouts in between where we put soluble corn fiber in a beverage and a muffin, so two servings a day, or it didn't have this, the same products didn't have the soluble corn fiber in for the control. And we saw this beautiful dose response benefit to retaining bone or preventing bone loss with additional added soluble corn fiber in these postmenopausal women. And now we're studying blueberries. So I don't have the data for you yet, but some fruits like dried plum have been shown to be effective. Blueberries in animal models look effective. We'll see if they are in humans. So we're taking freeze-dried blueberry powder and putting it into whips and granola bites and beverages, and we're using this calcium-41 method to determine whether that can benefit bone. So overall, building peak bone mass and reducing bone loss later are two strategies to reduce osteoporosis. In the early years, just 5 to 10% additional bone mass can reduce fracture substantially. Lifestyle choices can modify both ends, the developing peak bone mass and reducing bone loss. 
several of the essential nutrients important to bone tend to be shortfall nutrients in our diet, like calcium, vitamin D, magnesium. And maybe we'll find space for bioactive foods that will enhance our use of the calcium and prevent bone loss even more. So I want to acknowledge uh, the funding that I've had for the work I've shared with you and, of course, my lab group and collaborators. Thank you. I think we can take some questions. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? To, maybe to get us warmed up. There's a couple. That one, right? Great. A couple at the front here. Yeah. There you go. Uh, oh, oh, I see. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you could comment on the use of adretical in uh, osteoporosis medication. Uh, is that a bisphosphonate? It sounds like a trade name for a bisphosphonate. Yeah, I yeah, believe it is. Bisphosphonates work really well. And um, the, the concern is maybe some people have risks of some uh, side effects. And so they don't know how long you should be on them safely. So people are trying, physicians are trying drug holidays. So if you've been on a couple years, take a break try another medicine, but bisphosphonates work quite well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, what worried me about your um, presentation is the decrease in uh, calcium absorption with age. Yes, um, and <laughs> it's worrying me too. <laughs> if, you, if I've only got 5% absorption, what's the point of taking all these supplements? Well, you want to protect the bone as best you can, so you want to take at least the recommended intake of, of 1,200 milligrams a day up to 1,500 milligrams a day. If you know you have low bone density, that would probably be advisable. After that, it won't do you any good. You'll just excrete it. But, but you, that's what we know we can do. And then the soluble corn you, fiber can help you uh, a little bit more. Or, it showed. Right. I was just wondering, have you any idea why the absorption goes down? Yes. <laughs> uh, several things, like your vitamin D receptor numbers start decreasing, and vitamin D helps you with active calcium absorption, so your ability for that active calcium absorption falls off. That's one of the factors. Um, with so many people uh, reducing their milk intake these days, and some people actually are sensitive to it and can't drink milk, so all that good stuff about milk is kind of useless. Well, for some, but, but not everyone. Um, maybe maybe, that's, not, maybe but, not the majority. That's why we're trying to study the calcium from plant-based beverages, too, yeah, yeah. to see if they can be good substitutes for calcium. The soy beverage works, but there's still a fairly small market compared to cow's yeah. milk. So, so fortified, fortified soy milk is what you're saying? It has to be calcium fortified yeah. for any of these plant-based beverages. So calcium fortified orange juice has been tested and proved effective, and then we've tested the soy beverage, and it was um, proved effective, but the other beverages have not been tested. Well, I can hardly wait till you test them. <laughs> and the second question was, where can I get soluble corn fiber? Yeah. That okay, corn, that corn stuff. So <laughs> almost every major outlet, like um, Walmart or CV, uh, CVS Pharmacy, um, but you, it doesn't read on the label soluble corn fiber. You. <laughs> You uh, have to, I, I can share a slide of all the different brands I've got them. Oh, that would be great if we I, could I could leave it with you yeah, if you can, can get, get it out. Some names, that yeah. would be great. Yeah, to and give you to some names. No, but it, if you have an informed retail person to help you, they, <laughs> but often that's not the case in these major places, is it? But if you look and it says corn fiber or something, 
chances are it is soluble corn fiber. But if you ask somebody soluble corn fiber, they probably don't recognize it as such. I'll give you a slide. Yeah, great. Um, I was wondering about um, mega dosing on magnesium, if you've done any studies. So we're doing a magnesium bioavailability study right now, but not mega dosing, just different forms to see if um, the liquid form is as good or better than some of the pill forms. So mega dosing, um, I wouldn't advise going. Wow, I, I, I've never seen any evidence that that would benefit you. We're worried, most women are two thirds on average of the recommended intakes and men are three quarters. So we're worried about marginal deficiencies. I've, I've not seen any evidence that would recommend pushing it over the upper level, which that's way over the upper level. So I have a question about uh, lactose intolerance, mm -hmm. sort of building upon what was asked before. But um, I haven't looked into the research myself, but is there anything that's, um, any research about calcium absorption and those who are lactose intolerant? So like, would right. they decrease their absorption of calcium if they're consuming dairy products? They're similar. It, similar? Even it, with they're lactose? similar, right. Oh. It, it, the lactose does little in humans to enhance it, or if you're lactose intolerant or not, calcium absorption is the same. Even with all the digestive mm. issues? Yeah. Okay, but thank you. I presume from what you said about the vitamin D receptors decreasing over age, um, does that mean that um, increasing vitamin D over age would help balance that loss of calcium absorption or not? Um, it, vitamin D supplementation is only going to help you improve calcium absorption if you're really deficient. It turns out we don't need as much vitamin D as we used to think we did to maximize fractional calcium absorption. Some people are that low, but not too many would be as low as would compromise your fractional calcium absorption. So if you take away the active pathway for calcium absorption because you've lost receptors for vitamin D, then you rely on passive absorption. So. Passive absorption um, increases linearly with dose. So you can go up safely to 1,500 milligrams, maybe up to 2,000. I wouldn't exceed that, though. So 5% of 2,000 is giving you quite a bit of absorbed calcium. Thank you so much for this wonderful talk. It was very really interesting. Um, I was wondering if uh, you've ever thought about doing um, experiments with the type of calcium vitamin D thing using lactose intolerant um, patients because presumably they would not be consuming dairy, right? So they'd be a really good control group. So one of our camp calciums, the first one we did in all black girls, we did um, hydrogen breath analysis at the beginning and the end of three weeks and gave them, they were fed during those three weeks, 800 milligrams of calcium all through as dairy products. So almost all of them tested as um, lactose maldigesters at the beginning, but they tolerated very well 800 milligrams of calcium as dairy through the three weeks, and when we tested their hydrogen breath at the end, it improved, but we took daily records of symptoms and they hardly complained or anything, but they said milk wasn't in their refrigerators at home. Mom didn't buy it. Their families didn't consume it. They didn't seem to be bothered by it, and they didn't really even know what lactose intolerance meant, <laughs> but they all tested like hydrogen, with hydrogen breath as malabsorbers. Okay. 
So that shows you you can tolerate a fairly healthy supply in dairy spread out through the day with food quite well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Connie, I was fascinated by your corn fiber. Um, yeah. Tom, do, do you think it's small intestine or colon? Tom Wallow did some interesting studies here amongst his friends with rectal infusions of short-chain fatty acids with and without calcium and showed that the short-chain fatty acids, which you obviously get from the soluble right. fiber fermentation, increase calcium uptake. So I just wondered whether it was a colonic or a small intestinal effect? It, it's colonic because yeah. we did calcium absorption measured in the first 24 hours and the second 24 hours, and it showed no effect in the first 24 hours, only in the second 24 hours, consistent with having to get to the lower gut. So we've done two studies in kids in one study that I showed you in postmenopausal women. All were effective. So in the kids, calcium absorption improved by 12% by having soluble corn fiber. And then the bone measure I showed you with the postmenopausal women, I've been totally amazed. Um, there, be, there are another, a number of other studies ongoing now based on this research. So one is in University of California, San Diego, in bariatric patients. She, her first grant, and I'm a collaborator because I do the calcium isotope, measurements for her. But she measured calcium absorption in these women that were about to undergo bariatric surgery. And before, the average absorption was about 32%. After bariatric surgery, 7% in these same women. That's how much it was decreased by removing that much of their upper gut. So now she, she's got a NIH grant. She's trying to give soluble corn fiber to see if it rescues somewhat, anyway, their calcium absorption. We don't have the answers yet. There's a randomized controlled trial in children going on with soluble corn fiber in Malaysia. And a um, group in University of Miami just got a fundable score on an NIH grant to do a randomized controlled trial in children with bone mineral density. So it. Uh, the other thing I wanted to tell you is a collaborator at Michigan State does a mouse model for type 1 diabetes, and the, she had been looking at probiotics all along. But I talked her into putting in an arm of soluble corn fiber, and soluble corn fiber completely rescued the type 1 diabetes bone problems, and the inflammation markers were all corrected by soluble corn fiber. So now we're... Um, looking to try to get funding in humans to, with kids with type 1 diabetes to see if soluble corn fiber will protect against the bone loss in diabetes too. So it's been an amazing finding with this product. Uh, <clears throat> talking about corn, corn fiber, uh, Long time ago, we did study with different type of fiber looking at the effect on laxation and, and transit time. So we would find that corn fiber will slow transition, uh, transit time, still transit time. Uh, although when finally it's passed, it's good size of stool, <laughs> you know what I mean. And then we measured the composition of stool and we found that corn fiber compared to many other wheat and uh, we have different type um, uh, of fiber. Actually, uh, the stool was much drier. So my question is, was it any side effects when you will give I mean, constipation or anything like that? In neither the kids or the postmenopausal women were the symptoms greater than during the placebo period. So a very well tolerated. Other prebiotic fibers that we've studied can have the same benefits for calcium absorption, like uh, galactooligosaccharides, same 12% enhancement as soluble corn fiber. So it's not just that one. Okay, well, 
Thank you You're very welcome. much, Dr. Weaver. And thank you for the wonderful questions. Yeah, I was glad you were answering those and not me. They were <laughs> pretty tough. And uh, you did a great job and very informed question. So we do have a reception afterwards that you're um, all invited to and if you'd like to meet uh, Dr. Weaver oh, she'll please. be yeah. um, it, at the reception and uh, so we stand adjourned and we'll um, meet you in the reception. Thank you very much.